Greetings, and thank you for attending this month's science seminar presented by the NSF's National Ecological Observatory Network, which is operated by Patel. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community, community among researchers at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and neon. Today, we're excited to have Mike Bell from the National Park Service here to present. But before we turn it over to the speaker, a few logistics. We have enabled optional automated closed captioning for today's talk. If you would like to use it, please find the CC or closed captioning button in your Zoom menu. The webinar will consist of a presentation followed by a Q&A session. As you think of questions, please add them to the Q&A box. We also have a meeting chat. Use this to share links and other items of interest with the group, but add speaker questions to the Q&A. We will facilitate discussion at the end, and there will also be opportunity to ask questions over audio. NEON welcomes contributions from everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation as outlined in our NEON Code of Conduct. This applies to NEON staff as well as anyone participating in a NEON event. The full Code of Conduct is available via a link that I will share in the chat in a moment, and is also embedded in the Science Seminars webpage, which I'm showing on my screen, and I will also pop the link in the chat in a moment. This talk will be recorded and made available for viewing on the NEON Science Seminars webpage. You can access those by scrolling down to the list of talks, finding the talk from today, and when the recording is available, there'll be a recording available button. You can go ahead and click that and watch the talk at your leisure. To complement our monthly science seminars, we host related data skills webinars on how to access and use NEON data. Registration for those is available on the same science, science seminars webpage below the list of talks. You can find the list of data skills webinars. There are also recordings for those if you didn't get a chance to attend and would like to watch them separately on your own. The next one will be coming up in March. Lastly, if you have ideas for a talk for this seminar series, nominate yourself or a colleague today by filling in the form on the Science Seminars webpage. You can go all the way to the top, and here we've got our nominate a seminar speaker. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Teresa Burlingame to introduce today's speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Teresa Burlingame. Uh, I work and for NEON, largely with um, instrument system data quality. I am introducing Dr. Mike Bell today. He's an ecologist from the National Park Services Air Resource Division, where he researches the impact that air pollution has on plants, soils, and waters within federal lands. He previously worked in the field at multiple National Park Service units before getting his PhD in botany from UC Riverside, where he studied how desert plant communities change with increasing air pollution from Los Angeles. Today he's going to share how NPS scientists are relating air pollution data across the country to make risk assessments of sensitive species and ecosystems within NPS units, and discuss how this data is used to guide conservation and management decisions. Thank you for joining us. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Teresa. Um, all right. Well, um, everyone, thank you everyone for joining. Um, so I'm um, with the National Park Service Air Resources Division. Um, a lot of my colleagues who um, are work, I'm doing this work with are with the U.S. Forest Service and the, and the, and the U.S. EPA. Um, so it's a very uh, collaborative process. And with that, um, being government agencies, the views expressed in this presentation are those of the authors and don't necessarily reflect the views or policies of each agency. So to start off, I wanted to give a little bit of information about the National Park Service Air Resources Division, mostly because I feel like most people don't know that we exist, because I didn't know we existed prior to applying for this job here. Um, but basically, our goal is um, we are one of 10 national science offices in the National Park Service, and our, our, our goal is to allow visitors to breathe easy, see far, and let nature thrive. We do this by monitoring, monitoring air pollution across the country, uh, calculating pollution uh, levels where ecosystem harm is occurring, and synthesize this data to understand um, general risk to parks. And so we work across the entire U.S., across the entire Park Service, and um, 
to really provide that expertise to parks that might have an air pollution issue uh, that they don't have the local expertise to deal with. Uh, within this, um, the, like the results and the information that we provide, as well as the other national science offices are really to guide management actions. And then within ours is review permits for new pollution sources that are coming outside of the parks and then inform policy and regulations that the EPA is developing to re reduce future air pollutants. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we do this in, in a, a very broad interagency collaboration. Uh, so each of these federal agencies have slightly different missions, but we're all, we're all trying to use the same data so that at least we have the same numbers that we're applying um, appropriately. So the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service have similar but different missions and responsibilities, um, all, but with a, a part of their goal being to preserve natural resources. The EPA is more focused on the science of this and developing policy and um, um, using that science um, that will help um, all lands and people within the US. And the BLM has a, like a mixed mission that allows for some com commercial uses like grazing and oil and gas that generally have a net of negative effect on air pollution as well as some for conservation. So the core questions I'm asking today and um, hopefully answering is how is nitrogen and sulfur air pollution harming sensitive resources? How do we then use this to influence management policy? And then what I'm really excited about with this group is, is to, to figure out how we can integrate NEON and other data sources into this analysis, both in the application of what we know, as well as generating new data moving forward. So while most people think of national parks as these, these clean and pristine places, the air pollution levels that we're seeing, the threats from outside from air pollution sources are still causing significant damage to the parks. We have um, like a variety of like cars and agriculture. Um, we can see uh, uh, the smog um, and then fossil fuels all kind of uh, negatively impacting the visitor experience. This is a, a piece of EPA propaganda that I love to share that they really highlight the fact that um, look, we had, we've had like a 300% increase in the GDP since the Clean Air Act was signed in 1970, and along with that, a 78% decline in air pollution. So we are seeing significant declines, but my question is always like, why do we, we what would happen if we actually tried to reduce some of these numbers, like and in, in reduce our energy consumption or individual vehicle miles traveled? We could have even a greater effect on some of this stuff. So while these are this is great, the technology has improved and we're removing a lot of pollutants from the air. We had this opportunity to do even better. And that decline in those criteria air pollutants is having an effect. We're seeing soils recovering, we're seeing fish return to streams where they, they were absent after long periods of acid rain. We're seeing tree species respond, forests regenerate, two levels that they hadn't been at um, since um, pre-industrial or since like the, the peak acid rain in the 70s and 80s. So the first question is how much pollution is there? Uh, the National Park Service currently monitors pollution, uh, some kind of air pollution in 67 parks. Um, then additionally, we have a set of special studies like when we know a new pollution source is coming in or like a big oil and gas development is happening, um, we'll do more refined studies in those areas to understand the risk of what's going on. Additionally, we collaborate with the National Atmospheric Deposition Program that currently um, has five different networks uh, looking at a lot of it is either wet or dry deposition. The largest network has 261 sites that are currently active and collecting um, basically de like wet deposition from every precipitation event that happens. Um, a lot of this work that I'm going to be explaining today uh, comes from this coordinated research through the NADP, uh, through the science subcommittees that exist there. And um, with that, the, the main one I um, um, am involved with is the critical loads of atmospheric deposition, where we're trying to um, figure out how 
ecosystems respond at these deposition sites and at the areas between them. So we have these 261 sites, but we need to know what's happening in between those as well. So another science committee, the Total Deposition Science Committee at NDP, has been developing um, chem uh, these measurement model fusion products that um, take um, chemical transport models and modify them using that precipitation. So they're a little more refined a little, and hopefully a little more accurate so that we can do these analyses outside of uh, the monitoring sites. And you can see on the top row of figures, on the left, we have nitrogen. On the right, we have sulfur. And sulfur deposition was extremely high in uh, 2000, 2002, nitrogen deposition pretty much the entire East Coast. While on the bottom, we have the most recent deposition maps available. And you'll see with these uh, regulations put on um, fossil fuel burning in the Southeast, we have that star steep decline in, in sulfur pollution. And while you see some of that decline matched on the nitrogen side, you also see a lot of areas where um, no change has occurred. And that's like in the in the agricultural um, hotspots of the US because those pollutants aren't currently regulated from an atmospheric perspective. So we have all this pollution, whoops, this one, it's going into the sky. What happens when it comes down? Um, so mostly today I'm gonna be talking about nitrogen pollution just because I'm limited in time, but uh, also have a lot of these same responses um, happening for sulfur, sulfur pollution as well. So one thing is you have a change in biogeochemical cycle. You add a bunch of nitrogen to the soil, to the water. Um, it is uh, eutrophying um, elements, causes things generally to grow faster. Often it's bad things grow faster. So you have increased growth, uh, which leads to um, changes in mortality and shifts in species composition. Nitrogen especially causes um, leaf tissue, um, leaf chemistry to change, which can make the leaves uh, more more likely to be uh, eaten by herbivores, um, pests, um, etc. So we're seeing a lot of these, like both small, uh, short-term changes, as long as these long-term community composition shifts that are harder to overcome. Um, with time, once you, especially with like annual uh, plant species. And so in identifying the rate of deposition at which um, any of these changes are occurring, we kind of, we're, we're using this concept of the critical load. So this is the threshold of deposition below which this um, ecological harm does not occur. And generally we have four different responses that we see from deposition. The first is we have a decrease in response. So as um, nitrogen or sulfur pollution increases along the x-axis there, the ecosystem component that we're looking at decreases. Uh, one of the, the most sensitive species that I'll talk about uh, later is uh, lichen species communities. Because they pull all of their nutrients directly from the air, they're very sensitive to these changes. So any change in pollutants generally causes a quick decline in species richness. The second is an increasing. And I have this two different critical loads marked here with the circles, one at the bottom. So this is like generally, if you have like an invasive species in an area, the that stark increase um, is you want to prevent before that uh, exponential growth occurs. So kind of setting it before um, large increases. While if these are more gradual increases of native species that aren't really showing ecological harm will often either not set a critical load or set it at this higher level where um, we haven't like like really reached that level at which things start to decline yet. The last is a threshold response. And so this, we have this initial increase um, in growth or survival with increasing deposition and then you start to decline. And we go back and forth with this one um, between setting it at the highest level, which kind of marks that um, 
maximum growth conditions for a species and setting it at that level that's more equal to that initial growth space. And I think as we're advancing a lot of our critical load applications to uh, correlate with climate change, and carbon storage, and all those things, we really, we're, we're really more interested in this kind of endpoint of like, at what point are we reducing carbon storage past what it is, and also looking at the benefits of carbon storage as potential offsets. And the last is when there's no re relationship to nitrogen or sulfur, and then we have no so moved over the graphs to make this uh, a little clearer, but uh, when we combine the, the expected level of response to those deposition maps, we can calculate a critical load exceedance. And so this is when deposition is greater than the critical load, um, the, crit the critical load is said to be an exceedance. So this increases the risk um, that harm will occur to that ecosystem component. And uh, for most of these, we have a dose response relationship so that the higher the exceedance, the more intense the response. And just to note is like, will become apparent in some of the future slides, like uh, as with the, the previous slide, th these critical loads occur at different levels of sensitivity based on the ecosystem, based on the species itself, um, et cetera. So first, so now with um, that, we're gonna identify these different sensitive ecosystems. So the, the eight different categories that, that we have currently been classifying critical loads are alpine ecosystems, um, aquatic lakes. Um, we generally use more mountain lakes that are, they don't have upstream sources of pollutants. So it's pretty apparent that any changes are being caused by atmospheric deposition. We have herbaceous communities as a whole, then looking at herbaceous species individually. Uh, we have lichen community. Specifically here, we're gonna be looking at nitrogen sensitive lichens. Uh, we have tree, individual tree species growth, individual tree species survival over um, time, and then mycorrhizal fungi, change shifts in mycorrhizal fungi communities. So the point of this talk is gonna be more of the, um, the outputs that we're generating rather than how the critical loads were set. So really this is kind of all the data that goes into these different models. I just kind of want to highlight that most of these relationships are showing a decreasing response um, at some point in the relationship to nitrogen, while some of them are showing this increasing response. So um, for each of these, we um, are identifying um, the community at which they're hap which they're happening. So within these closed vegetation, these are forested communities. Lichen are generally occurring in forested communities. These are alpine lake responses. These are individual herbaceous species responses and individual tree responses. And we take those responses and we overlay those with either um, land cover data of where a forested or grassland shrubland area occurs or when we have data points um, within parks, within um, federal uh, land areas, we can put species um, points directly into, um, onto the deposition map to show where the, uh, the harm is occurring. And generally, for the purpose of this talk, when you're looking at these maps, red equals bad, so that's where harm is occurring. Blue equals good, um, so that's where the deposition isn't high enough to cause harm. And then the yellow areas are kind of that, uh, the edge of that transition. And so those, those areas are really important so, this, so that we, because you can have potentially the most impact there of uh, preventing a uh, ecosystem from starting to climb or reducing pollution so that we can allow for these ecosystems to recover. So now we're taking that national data and moving it more towards the local space. So the, the dots here are of class one areas within um, the US. Class one areas have special protections under the Clean Air Act that um, kind of give these federal agencies teeth in pushing back um, against the EPA and against these polluters and that these areas need to be protected from harm from any new pollution source that comes into effect. 
I'm going to zoom in um, on a Rocky Mountain National Park and kind of show these how kind of how these two different data sets look up close. On the left here, we have uh, the critical load of nitrogen for a decline in N-sensitive lichen um, species richness. And this is basically a single value over the forest. And you can see that most of the area is in exceedance while there's a small area that is right around that critical load. Then on the right here, these are individual plot locations for um, herbaceous species surveys from which we then put the individual critical loads into these sites. And most of them you see have, are blue, so they have um, not expected to shift the community dynamics. Well, there's a couple of hotspots with sensitive species um, that would allow uh, directed management in these areas or uh, maybe potential revisits to the sites if those species that are there are of importance. We then pull all the data together um, and we can provide each park with a quick summary of the potential risk of to their site. Um, and so here is like a, this is kind of what we were working with initially, which um, looked at the different critical loads relative to the total nitrogen deposition. And if it's red here, the lower threshold, just it means that every area in the park is gonna be in exceedance. If it's blue, that means it's above the highest threshold of deposition, which is, that's one you don't have to worry about. And yellow is like likely some areas of the park are in exceedance. We then pull all that together and we have this uh, summary of critical load data. So if you have a regional um, biologist or uh, someone from a monitoring network, they can kind of pull out the parks they're interested in, get a general overview of what's going on very quickly. One of the new tools, let's see if I can do this. Cool. Um, I just put some links in the chat um, where you can um, look at kind of some of the stuff that we're talking about. If you're getting bored here, just want to put, putter about. Um, we have our, um, our conditions and trends page, which overall um, from the Air Resources Division shows the current condition of different air pollutants in each national park and the trend of how that um, pollute, the concentration or the amount of deposition of that pollutant is changing over time. So the this ecosystem response is a, a new um, component to the uh, the conditions and trends where we're using that model data to look at the maximum, median, and minimum deposition over time. And in Rocky, you can see it's kind of the, the recent models are showing the maximum is kind of increasing, um, while the minimum deposition seems to be slowly de decreasing over time. So um, a lot of that has to do with the elevation range at the park where you're with, at higher elevations, you're getting more precipitation and thus more deposition coming down. Then we advance those fig those previous figures into um, these that fair and poor benchmark. So where before you're saying some of the park might be ex in exceedance of that, this uh, this kind of gives you that that better reference of um, how much of each area is in decline. So of all of the alpine area, like all of it seems to be above the lower benchmark, while most of it is below the higher. Uh, while mycorrhizal communities, you'll see only a small area is above the um, that lower benchmark and even smaller above the higher. So you can kind of get the, a, a better sense of the, uh, the broader range of impact. Um, I didn't put them in here, but I put two other links in um, the chat as well. That one is for mapping of the critical load. So you can actually see the spatial distribution of the exceedances, so you can really understand if the area that you're interested in um, has an exceedance. You can even zoom in to neon sites or anywhere else in the U.S. because all of the data sets are um, eventually going to be included in there. The third link is to these critical load summary reports. So if you're interested in exactly the amount of area, the number of the, the list of species that are occurring, 
uh, within these herb occurrences of tree growths and the number of them that we have, all of that like very refined data is in there. So those are for more of the expert person um, rather than the higher level um, manager who's just kind of interested if anything is happening. Okay, then we are taking all of that together and um, kind of evaluating the the parks or the, in this case, the class one areas in totality. So the first on the left is like where we have the most data. And we had those eight different uh, critical load categories. So the highest number here is eight. And then there's a handful where we have either zero or one. Given that one of those eight is alpine areas, as well as um, having aquatic resources, you'll see the highest numbers around the Rocky Mountains and the Cascades and Sierras of the West, just because of those, some of these components just don't, don't have the opportunity to exist. We then look at the total condition of each of those resources so that we can kind of get a sense of like where, what parks are being most impacted by air pollution, what, and then where can we dive in to figure out what's going on and what additional information we need to um, assess the, uh, like what, like what is happening on the ground? What, like is there, are there management actions that, or policy uh, implications or policy actions that we can take to reduce harm to the parks? Summarizing some of this data, um, looking at the different class one areas, uh, we have some data on critical loads currently for almost all um, class one areas. There's a handful of Fish and Wildlife Service sites and a couple of National Park Service sites where we don't. A lot of these are more of the coastal areas that just are outside of the range of most of these larger data sets. Um, we then have the count of critical loads and the, uh, the count of exceedances. And again, you'll see the Fish and Wildlife Service has the lowest number. Mostly that's because their air program has, um, hasn't had a biologist in place for a while who's been interested or has had the ability to um, pull data from those um, uh, refuges. They don't have a central database of um, plots available. But otherwise, we have um, four to five critical loads, four National Park Service and Forest Service sites. And currently, the Park Service sites are slightly cleaner, like having less harm um, than uh, Forest Service. Same thing for uh, critical loads of sulfur. And we're seeing fewer critical load exceedances overall. And that's mostly because of that um, steep decline in uh, sulfur deposition that I highlighted earlier. So how are we using this data specifically? Um, a lot of it, as I mentioned, we provide that science, scientific expertise to MPS units, um, and then we inform, we inform policy, and we do then help reduce the risk from new sources. And we do that in part through the the MPS is going through a big resource resource stewardship strategy development process where in the past, like air pollution is something we would come in uh, when a new source is outside of the boundary or just like in case of an emergency or someone um, came to us. But with this, we're able to kind of build air, air risk from air pollution into their 10-year uh, their plan of managing the park. Um, one thing that's been great by having these tools available is um, linking to uh, connecting with um, park managers and biologists to have a place for them to put their data. A lot of times in the past, when we say, hey, we're working on this big project, can you, do you have any data on X, Y, or Z? There would be a little hesitation because the Park Service is, has been challenged in the past of having the resource to do something with it. So it takes a lot of time to pull it together and there's not often anything that comes back to the park. And now that we have this tool in place, if it's like, hey, if you give us the data, we can plug it right into this, this tool and you'll have an output of which of these species, which of this data is um, uh, um, being responsive to our pollution. 
Um, then just by prioritizing those areas and species that are at risk, we can prioritize active management, restoration, mitigation, and then work with local stakeholders to minimize emissions and potentially new sources of pollution. So I'm going to go through a couple of case studies. Um, the first is at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, this was a collaboration with Syracuse University where um, they modeled the deposition level at which um, um, these stream, the red streams here are those that are in exceedance of the uh, of the critical load that have um, uh, pH low, low enough that uh, fish and other invertebrates aren't able to survive in the waters. And so we're looking to determine the level of deposition that would support healthy fish populations and the recovery of other aquatic uh, invertebrates. So we're starting with uh, looking at the long-term deposition of the site going from 2000 to 2015. And uh, so when this uh, was started, we we're at about 7.8 kilograms per hectare per year. And based on current uh, regulations in place, we are expected by 2030 to get down to 6.2, which is still significantly above this natural background that we expect to be around one where these ecosystems evolved. So from that, we set up these target loads. Like, how can we get down to um, about 3.1 kilograms per hectare, which is a 60% reduction from those initial levels? And if we did that, like this is based on that modeling, you would see about 57% of those streams recovered by 2080. Um, so this was a, um, a big undertaking, bringing in um, the states in the areas and trying to get everyone on the same page so that those uh, uh, sources outside of the park were involved in the process and knew the value not only to people, but also the culture and um, ecosystems around Rocky Mountain National, or sorry, uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And the exciting thing here is that within the five, six years after, we've actually significantly dropped below this, um, this target line and we're doing better than expected. So I think this is, um, can't say it's 100% uh, it's, uh, aligned with just our actions, but it's nice that when you're setting this glide slope of uh, long-term recovery to get, get below it early, so you, it's, it's not as much of a stress to respond later. The next is at Rocky Mountain National Park, um, kind of a similar issue where, but here we have um, emissions coming in from the Greeley, uh, Fort Collins area. Did you have a lot of cattle, a lot of agriculture there? The handful of times a year, you have these east, east to west storms come in that blow all of that pollution um, from the valley up into Rocky Mountain National Park and causes additional deposition there. So here we look at all the critical loads. So here we have uh, the x-axis is nitrogen again. The y-axis is kind of that level, all of the different ecosystems that you can see. And you can see that with our current deposition, you have a lot of areas that are in exceedance. Um, and we are trying to move to this target load where most of these ecosystems are not going to be impacted. And a lot of this is based on these uh, uh, like the diatoms in the alpine lakes um, that are most sensitive to pollution. And so here we started meeting with farmers, we started meeting with the local communities and tried to develop a, uh, a set of best practices and an early warning system. So if the forecast called for one of these storms that was coming through, what actions could farmers take to reduce their um, uh, the emissions from their sites that would then blow to the park. So this started in about 2006 and between 2006 and 2012, uh, we were looking right on the glide slope, we were making good progress, and then had a couple of big rain years, had um, some uh, just things outside of our control, it seems, that led to kind of an increase in deposition. Um, missed that slope, started coming down again, and then we're going back up. And so this one's a little less um, 
obviously successful, but the relationships that we've built and the connections we've made both within the community and within the park and has been really valuable in like spreading um, the word of the connectedness of our actions and not just be uh, this is happening here, the parks are protecting over there, but we're all in the same like world, we're in the same ecosystem. And it's made it a lot easier for us to communicate kind of around um, the topics and help advance the science even more, both in the transport and deposition of pollutants. Okay. The next is a more uh, that direct to EPA um, method. So every there's, I think it's every five years they're supposed to um, reevaluate the science um, to make sure that the current national ambient air quality standards are still protective of human health and the environment. Um, and this is like where um, the, this is um, based off the Clean Air Act and um, setting these numerical increments of pollution, um, both for new sources, modified sources, as well as looking like um, and using the data to determine that causal relationship between pollution and uh, welfare. So a lot of this work um, goes into filling these boxes in the integrated science assessment that the policy is based off of. When I first started here back in 2015, there was a lot more hash, um, lighter colors that they're showing that the, these relationships were more suggestive, suggestive or likely causal. But based on the research and based on the guidance from the EPA of like, hey, this isn't strong enough yet, we've been able to show that there are these causal relationships um, between nitrogen and sulfur deposition, especially, and ecosystem responses. So recent um, rulemaking, uh, the recent updates to the NACs um, were actually were released last week. And there's some disappointment that even though all of these boxes are green, you'll see on the bottom for nitrogen, like nitrogen concentrations, there was no secondary standard set that to highlight the fact that these things were occurring. But um, I don't know why I'm going from the bottom up, but sulfur um, for the first time set a secondary standard that is different from the primary standard for a criteria pollutant. So it's, it's, it's exciting that they're taking a step forward. Unfortunately, the standard they set it at is currently below any level of that position that we see in any class one area or any park. Um, so we're getting there, but not quite there. And then lastly, the primary standard for PM 2.5 um, is being decreased from 12 to nine. And this is gonna be hugely beneficial for human health but also a huge component of PM 2.5 are these like ammonia agricultural emissions that will result in a, will likely result in a decline in nitrogen. So it, it is a secondary effect to um, PM, but should have, um, uh, should improve general air quality. So we're excited and supportive of those things happening. And then um, lastly, it's like, so when, there is a new pollution source coming out. Um, we work with the park to pull together data um, and kind of identify um, what is at risk and how things are at risk. So quickly, there was uh, in Alaska, a, uh, a natural gas pipeline that was being um, uh, posed outside of Denali National Park. And the pipeline was gonna be along the Eastern um, side of the park. Our NADP site here is in one of the cleaner areas. It was kind of away from where this pipeline was gonna have an impact. Uh, so we use these deposition models, kind of highlight what the, the current level of deposition is. And then with the park biologist um, identified the uh, lichen species that are occurring there, those that are, um, potentially likely to be impacted by deposition. And so in conversation, in the permitting process, we kind of highlight, it's like, hey, we have an endangered lichen, it exists in this community, these are the critical loads, and um, we are able to use that data to convince them or uh, like 
assist in their decision making to put additional controls on the facility so that less pollution would go into the park and there would be less of an impact on um, these lichen species potentially. So this is like, well, I was really excited. And when I first signed up to give this talk, I was hoping to collaborate in advance and pull together a little more data from the neon sites, but alas, life and other projects got away. So I did a quick, like a quick analysis of all of this data from the different sites within the contiguous US and hope that we can use this as like a guiding structure um, for future collaborations and getting more information on the on sites. So first just pulled um, the uh, deposition data um, on sites. Um, there are many of them that are kind of above this seven to 10 threshold that we often think of is when large shifts um, in ecosystems start to occur. And then pulled um, the critical load data from um, overlapping uh, from the, the neon polygons, as well as for some of them where we had species data, having a buffer um, around the spot just to pull in some of our um, our nearby data that where species are likely to occur at uh, the neon site as well. And I think most importantly, the um, herbaceous species presence and trees, like I'm, I assume that all of your sites have um, vegetation and plants. This is, uh, our data set is, is, is pretty sparse in the Western US. So it's, it's pretty clear that those are uh, likely gonna be missing. And then trees I'm sure exist at a higher number than we have here. Um, but yeah, so like just pulling out, we had really good data on, on these more um, uh, consistent um, data sets across the US. And in general, we were seeing uh, higher conditions for these higher critical loads of herbaceous species and uh, lower for the more sensitive lichens and um, uh, mycorrhizal species. And trees were, uh, were looking, and trees and herbs from what we had were pretty good as well. So the, uh, looking at the, putting those conditions in the map, uh, the most, uh, healthiest um, sites relative to air pollution were these um, southwestern sites um, for the most part and then some in the plains. When you get higher in the mountains, you're getting more deposition, more uh, known ecosystems that are sensitive. Um, so you see some declines. The Midwest here is where we're seeing that higher deposition load and then along the Appalachians in the east, also more in the mountains. Um, so seeing like having this list of the, these are the sites with uh, poor condition that had the most critical loads um, that I had. So with that, I'm hoping to develop some collaborations um, with NEON as well as other um, partners to expand the data that we're using these analyses maybe develop some uh, first for application of like, hey, where do these species occur? Then use that data to develop new models, especially for species that we didn't have a lot of points for and hopefully new critical loads that can help us be more, protect um, park resources, et cetera, in the future. Um, so uh, yeah, I wanna include um, data from the NEON surveys. I can give a more accurate representation of what's going on, then compare um, compare that long-term data, looking at how species and communities are responding at these sites of varying deposition to see if it matches. Like all this data is gonna be outside of our current um, data set. So we can like really uh, test and confirm what we've been saying, and then hopefully integrate that into uh, into these models in the future. Uh, so with that, I will take any questions. Uh, if you want to email me directly, uh, my email is here. Uh, this is a, a picture of me um, searching for air pollution at the bottom of the Grand Canyon by collecting uh, lichen a couple of years ago. So it's 
the nice thing about air touching everything is you get to go to cool places to look for it. So thank you very much and look forward to the questions. Wow, fascinating. That was so cool to see where the neon sites fall, even though it was very preliminary. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I can start with the uh, chat here. It looks like there are already a handful of questions. Let me expand on that a little bit so I can see it better. Um, the first question that came in was, uh, what are all of the pollutants that are being monitored by the NPS? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> we we do it. Like, there's a lot of, there's nitrogen, there's uh, sulfur and wet deposition, as well as base cations, et cetera. We do visibility um, through particulate matter, um, looking at various stages. We've expanded our uh, purple air monitoring is like a cheap and easy um, particulate monitoring in parks. Uh, ozone is another big one, um, looking both at the human health effects of peak ozone levels, as well as the, the continuous mid to high level ozones for vegetation impacts. Uh, mercury has been uh, increasingly important over the years, uh, both in looking at mercury within uh bioindicators, both like in insects up into fish. And then we have been expanding and interested in microplastics and PFAS and uh, pesticides and other toxics that are coming in as well. Um, so we have a, a very broad uh, measurement program, monitoring program, uh, some more expansive than others. Great, thanks, Mike. I felt like that one was a little bit of a pop quiz. That there would be a yeah, long list. Was that my boss? Do you want to see <laughs> what, if I knew what was going on? <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, the next one here. Uh, how do you decide the critical load thresholds for different pollutants? Does it vary with tree species versus herbs? And does it vary across ecosystems and or parks? Let's see if I can go back. Check it out, it's the other way. Um, Okay, um, so basically we uh, develop these models that integrate local conditions, temperature, precipitation, soil pH, um, et cetera, and looking, look at responses with nitrogen and sulfur across them. So in this case, there's nine, like this is 71 of, I think, there are up to 145 different tree species that show different types and uh, levels of responses. This is, I think, 350 herbaceous species, and each one of these is a different type of response. So you have different levels of sensitivity where they start declining, different rates of decline, um, and um, so yeah, each of them kind of responds individually. Some of them will have like a temperature and like temperature by nitrogen precipitation by nitrogen response. So we're able to modify that critical load when um, uh, ground conditions or environmental conditions are changing too. So it's like it's an ever expanding data set that as we do more of these analyses gets more complex and how where how and where and why uh, where applying all the data. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Are these data publicly available as shape or CSV files? And if yes, where can they be accessed? Yes, um, let's see. I'll put it in the chat in a little bit when I can when I get my screen back. Um, but yeah, the through the NADP and the Critical Loads of Atmospheric Deposition program, we've developed a national critical load database. And so this is a mix of shape and CSV files that um, have all, like we, we try to get as much of the published data um, into it as fast as possible. We um, have been suffering through 
staffing issues and are behind a couple of years. So not all of this is in there yet, but we're hoping to have everything I presented here in there uh, shortly. Additionally, the, the mapping um, website that I put in the chat should have access to um, or downloadable files for at least lichens, trees, and aquatic data. Um, and we'll be getting the rest of it in there soon. Awesome, thanks. We can definitely relate to uh, too much data, not enough time. Yeah. Um, and then let's see one more here. It says, uh, sorry, I may have missed this at the beginning, but do the critical loads only include wet deposition or are you also measuring dry deposition with these numbers? If it's only wet, does that mean, what does that mean for drier sites? One of the challenges of oh, critical load science is that we've pulled this, they've been developed over the last 10, 15 years or so the quality of our deposition information is better today than it was 15 years ago. So some of the original ones were just based on wet deposition. Um, those were gonna be more of your, um, like okay, kind of those aquatic sites where like, we were seeing very obvious responses at the beginning. More, Recently, we've based them off of these total deposition measurements. So it is incorporating usually modeled uh, dry deposition, which is has some uncertainty, inherent uncertainties itself. I'm combining that with measured and modeled wet deposition. So we are getting a better sense of the total amount that's coming down. Is like one of the big questions I have, and I'm I'm really interested in pursuing, especially with um, climate change in the next couple of years, is uh, how the timing of deposition and time like aligning with timing of precipitation is impacting the response of the ecosystem. So uh, I did a lot of my work in Joshua Tree in Southern California. If you have no rain from June to November when the highest deposition is occurring, you kind of just get this layer of nitrogen on the surface. And then once the first rain comes, like is all that nitrogen actually being bioavailable? Is it being processed in, in minute as gases? Is it uh, washing off into the, the rivers, et cetera? So we're really trying to refine some of these analyses to get that temporal component involved as well. Right, thank you. Um, it looks like that was all that was in the Q&A, but there is one in the chat from Sam Simkin. Um, great talk, Mike. What do you think the prospects are for a NOx secondary standard in the next five years or so? And then I'd also personally like to tack on if you could um, add a little bit more definition to the difference between a primary and secondary standard. Okay, yeah, the, the primary standards are set to protect human health. And so those are required by law, like based on the most recent science, what level of pollution causes people to get sick and die, basically. So we're getting like each of those, most years they get a little bit stronger as the science gets a little bit clearer that what we're currently doing is still causing a lot of harm. Secondary standards are meant to protect human welfare and they, they can be set at the same level of the primary and welfare is a very expansive definition going from how people enjoy uh, the outdoors and how that contributes to our, our, our life to um, just other secondary impacts of pollution, um, et cetera. So, one of the big challenges in setting a secondary standard that relates to ecosystem health is that EPA is currently unwilling to consider a deposition-based standard. Uh, their interpretation of the Clean Air Act is that it needs to be aligned with concentrations in the atmosphere. 
And because of these, this variation in wet and dry deposition, variation in deposition rates um, from one ecosystem to another, you it's a lot more challenging to relate a single concentration to these impacts. And we're, so we've been trying to uh, advance that there's people within the Air Resources Division who are looking at that question. Uh, how can we better relate um, concentrations to deposition with a single value across the US? Um, all of these data product, see that one of the problems with this last assessment is a lot of this data you'll see um, is from 2017 to 2019 and the cutoff for uh, references included in this last analysis, I think, was 2017. Because partly this is pandemic delays, partly it's just the way things are. But um, it, yeah, I feel like we're getting closer. I mean, I feel like they a move the goalposts every time, where. 10 years ago, they were just like, oh, do X, Y, and Z. We did X, Y, and Z. They're like, nah, maybe you need to do A, B, and C. So we did A, B, and C. And like, ah, well, now we have this whole deposition concentration issue. So um, I think it's going to happen. But one of the big challenges and one of the things I'm interested to see with the sulfur secondary standard is there, because a secondary standard hadn't previously been set, we don't, like, it isn't clear how they would enforce it. Um, so I'm hoping that this allows for some of those early questions to be asked, like if this is in exceedance, how, how would this be implemented? What, um, what's like the, the consequence of exceeding it? And then, I don't know, I'm always hopeful. I wouldn't do this work if I didn't feel like we weren't, we didn't have a chance to make a difference. But as, um, with the case studies that I showed, I think one of the biggest one of the most important things for us to do really is develop these relationships with the local communities and sources. The more people care and understand and see that relationship between both of our consumptive actions and our daily um, movements, mobile actions, the more likely that we're going to be able to develop the groundswell of the to make shifts and improve the quality of the air, so. Agreed, thank you. Um, well, that was all the questions we have and we're near the end of our hour. So I'm gonna let uh, Sam take it from here for some closing notes. Great, yeah, thank you for a wonderful seminar. That was extremely interesting, especially thinking about giving us food for thought how the NEON data might contribute to these efforts. So we look forward to learning more about that in the future. Mike, please keep us keep us in dialogue. Um, our next science seminar is going to be Tuesday, March 12th, where we're going to hear about leveraging neon airborne remote sensing data to better understand how ecosystems are responding to disturbances. So please join us for that. Um, and in the meantime, take care. Thanks again for a great seminar. Bye-bye. Thank y'all for having me. Talk to y'all soon.